Okay, welcome to Collection and Copyright Coffee Talk. My name is Christy Padron, Scholarly Communications Librarian. For today's part of the series, we have Larry Mello, who is the coordinator of Government Documents. Welcome, Larry. Thanks so, for having me today, Christy. Sure, sure. So I'd like to welcome all library and staff and faculty who are here. I don't think we have to introduce ourselves because we all know each other. <laughs> <laughs> but as the series has gone on, it's highlighted the FAU library specialized collections that aren't part of the usual book stacks. So we had the heads of the units of those specialized areas describe them. We'll also discuss copyright and how it applies to those collections. So as we know, copyright is, a, is part of the law that is to be interpreted within a setting or situation. And there are very few specifications of how this is done. So we hope to provide some information in a very low stake setting so you could be informed about copyright and how it applies to the library. And of course, we can uh, learn more about the interesting collections that we have in the library. We're not attorneys and we can't give legal advice, but we can describe how it may apply to the library and its various areas. So finally, thank you again. And Larry, um, we got Larry. <laughs> so Larry, you, you got your start with the government as a submariner in the US Navy, and then you pursued some histories, some of your degrees in history. Can you describe those experiences to us who don't know? Sure. Um, and well, actually, even before I became a submariner, and same with everybody out there who's an American citizen from birth, you know, your your birth certificate is a government document. It's just at the state level. Your Social Security uh, card, if you once you get one, is a government document. So even from an early age, we all had government documents in our possession. But yes, I was a submariner. I joined right out of high school. I uh, was part of the Trident Force. That, For those who don't know, the Trident Force is those larger submarines that have nuclear capability to, if called upon, rain fire and nuclear warfare upon everybody. And so like some people like to say, well, you didn't see any action. I said, well, my job was to make sure we didn't have to see action. And thank God. Well, at least the four years I was, and since then, we've yet to have to launch a single nuclear missile. So we're doing our job as a deterrent. From there, I came to FAU. Um, I, first, I went to BCC, then BCC, now Broward College, got my AA degree, then came to FAU as a transfer student, earned a BA and an MA in history. Um, it's a great department. Um, and the history department, one thing from the history department that they teach us really well is how to do research. And doing research, you learn that the viable source or tool is government documents, especially depending on the era of history that you're studying. My area of expertise tends to be the colonial American, early American history. A lot of documents came out of that era. Yes, we had Vicki, too, um, interview with us for the first series. She's also a history and material culture uh, area, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, me and Vicki, our first class together was 3150 Research Methods class with Dr. <laughs> Breslow, who's now retired, but yep. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's how far back we go. Mm -hmm. So you made a reference to government documents saying that pretty much soon after we're born, we get some. Could you give us a definition of government documents? I understand that they do come from many different sources, like the local, state, and federal levels. Well, yes, you have um, obviously your, your local or uh, your local level, right? You, you go to the DMV, you get your driver's license, and then that comes from this granted from the state. So we have uh, local government documents tend to be held more in tune with the local uh, government agencies, you know, but like the city of Boca, the city of Davie, and uh, whatever. Um, then you have your state documents that come through Tallahassee, and the agencies that come out, you know, like the uh, Department of uh, Wildlife, uh, the Department of um, and others from Tallahassee. The interesting about uh, government uh, state documents is sometimes the agencies change titles depending on the governor. So whenever you're dealing with Florida documents, sometimes you have to, you'll see a catalog record per se with one agency title, and then it changes. To, and that's because usually a governor comes into place, play, and they decide to change things up. And then, as we know, we have the federal level. You know, and that's everything that's basically published or printed and created by the different agencies, both uh, the agencies that fall under the White House, 
Congress and the Supreme Court. Okay, thank you. So the FAU Libraries is a government document repository. What does that mean? And what is the library's role with these documents? Okay, well, as you can see behind me, we are, as Chrissy said, we are part of the Federal Depository Library Program. Uh, See, that, was, that didn't work. <laughs> but anyways, um, we are we have been one since 1963, 64. Um, so we've been since basically since the university has been established. And well, like I said, the government publishes or prints uh, produces documents. Uh, there's two types of libraries in this program. One is called a regional, and one is called a selector. Uh, we are what we are called a selector, and there's a, uh, about a dozen or so selectors throughout the state of Florida, and our job is not to have everything that the government produces. We are allowed to select um, based on our constituency, the types of people, uh, personnel or citizens that we deal with. Um, so we have about 65 to 70 percent of what the government does create. We do have in our collection both either in print or in electronic. Um, I mentioned the regional, that is the University of Florida for the state of Florida. Um, and so by law, and we are a, a agency or we fall under the jurisdiction of Congress. Mm -hmm. So under through their jurisdiction, the regional has to have access to everything. That's anything that is uh, presented in paper format, print format, and up until recently, microfiche. Mm -hmm. But that is has gone in the way of the dodo, as they say, because oh, um, it's just a, a a medium that's no longer uh, usable since you know digitalization has come. You know, like what Joanne has done, the government is doing uh, well. And not, actually, ninety eight percent of what the government uh, produces today doesn't even see the light of paper. It goes straight to a permanent URL, and we get receive everything that is electronic and it's uploaded into our catalogs. Wow, so there's plenty of, most of the government documents nowadays at the federal level are born digital as the saying goes, or native yeah, and, digital. Mm -hmm. um, as of right now, we're still doing, we still get print. We get about 10% of our stuff is print, but uh, GPO, which is the government publishing office, they just recently changed their name from the government printing office because they were the, and still is are the largest producer of print material in the world. Oh. Um, that they had had a task force actually this was just within weeks of us doing the prelims for this conversation mm -hmm. that, that, that they are going to go all digital um they don't have a hard date yet um basically so everything that the government will produce and publish will go digital that's not to say that they won't print items on a case-by-case -case basis they'll leave that up to the agency but they won't be doing mass printing in the near future mm, okay and that's an interesting point. You said they leave certain things up to the agency. So there's certain requirements, but then they do leave wiggle room for the agencies, it sounds like. Well, they'll, what they'll do is they'll basically everything that the agency's Department of Defense or the Department of Interior produce, they'll produce it electronically. But say if the Department of Interior says, hey, we got this nice little coffee tabletop type book that we like really we think it would be good printed in a you know bound set or so someone could have it to show or display then they'll print it up but um based on the report i read is within the near future everything will be electronic everything will have a pearl um which actually make um will make it easier for u.s citizens to have access to the material and 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 if I didn't mention it before, that is the real, the ultimate role of what a federal depository library is for, is to provide access to government information to all our citizens. Because uh, the theory is they want, they would prefer like U.S. citizens to be informed of what's going on. You know, not everything is is made available. Obviously, we know things are top secret uh, and, and kept at different levels. I think uh, we were joking around. Somebody wanted me to. <laughs> ask how how fast the submarine can go or how fast how deep they can go technically there is, there is a government document on that but it's been classified so i couldn't even tell you because you guys don't have clearance <laughs> larry you mentioned about a pearl you said documents are given um online documents are given pearls what's a pearl a pearl is a permanent uh link um, and so it's not linked directly to a website it's a link kept on a server through gpo oh. so it's uh the chances of it crashing or going away are, are very slim to none, like when, which makes it easy. And, and what, I think what really pushed GPO to go all electronic was COVID. Mm. 
you know, when um, federal depositories were closed down, there was that worry, how are we going to keep our citizens informed that the libraries are closed down, don't have access to the material. But um, like I said, we've been, uh, my predecessor, uh, Bruce Barron, and before, and uh, also myself, we've been receiving everything that they do create electronically already. So we have a large selection, a very large selection of electronic resources. And it's just be in the near future that everything will be electronic. Well, it's not to say we'll, we'll still have paper. There's still something to say about holding a book, especially uh, my, one of my favorite collections is the, the War of the Rebellion collection. Oh, yes. We talked about that. I, I just, when you told me that, I just nodded and smiled. But then I'm like, wait a minute, what is the War of the Re Rebellion again? Well, for those who don't know, War of the Rebellion is what we also call the, the American Civil War. Uh, it's, and the funny thing about that, that collection is it actually wasn't originally created through the government. It was actually created through a, pri a private uh, group to provide uh, documentation for the the families of the veterans who serve both sides because the collection is unique because it has both northern communications as well as confederate communications daily memos letters you know uh, orders given for troop movements um so th that they had a chance to understand what their relatives who served in the war on either side um went through Wow, what a rich collection of primary sources. That's that's amazing. I mean, everything from the tactical things, logistical things, and even the day by day of just regular soldiers. Wow, that, what a exactly. rich source. Is, is that type of um, document something that's available to be searched, even though we have it in print? Could it be searched from online? Uh, Do we have are, it available online? I believe. Um... Trying to, I don't remember off the top of my head uh, which university had digitized it, uh, but we do have uh, links to uh, the material um, as far as how searchable they are, as far as like a typical database where you can do keyword searches. I haven't played with it because, again, I just go straight to the print. When, I, when it comes to that particular document, this is something about holding you know, the original, even if it's a third generation copy, but it's still... <laughs> Knowing that, you know, these are the communications uh, from, you know, Stonewall Jackson to Grant to Sherman. So I've got a family member who likes looking at a lot of the Civil War stuff, but he's in another state. So, well, oh. you can always give him my primary source slip guide. <laughs> So, wow, what, yeah, I really thought the librarians would like that, that particular bit of information. But yes, yeah. yeah. go ahead. Okay. Oh, I was going to go on to the next question about okay. um, the that that the library here is designated as a federal repository, and you as you said earlier, with as a selectional status, I believe you said. Mm -hmm. Yes. So your unit has particular responsibilities over the materials it has in its collection, and you described some of the aspects of the law there, and this is known as stewardship. Can you give us an example or describe a collection that comes from a government agency? and then how your area makes it available or ingests it into the collection? Well, like as I said, the one I mentioned was the War of the Rebellion, uh, and that was actually created um, by the War Department, uh, Department, an agency that's no longer in existence, per se. Um, we now have the Defense Department, Department of Defense. Um, we also have, um, there's congressional records. We have electronically offered. Uh, the congressional record is a very unique uh resource where it's the daily account of what happens on the floor of Congress. So if they are having a squabble about what to do next as far as what um, holidays that they should create or roads to be built or, or they're just having one of those nasty, you know, he said, she said type of, you know, conversations. If it's on the official floor, it's in the official record. Wow. Um, so yeah. then, so that's interesting because now the news may say certain things, and I, I don't want to go in that direction. But just to just to say, it, it, you know, quickly that the news says one thing, but we can actually go into the primary source, the actual conversation itself there, and the documentation of it. Oh yeah. So like I said, the congressional the congressional record. If anything is said uh, from the podium to uh, the House uh, to to Congress. Uh, whether it be through it as a debate or just you know bringing up a motion, it's listed there. So again, it's like the you know you open up a daily journal of what somebody did on any given day. Uh, we have paper. We have a, a, another large collection. We have 
um, is the uh, communications from the State Department. Um, so you have these are things that have been declassified. These are your memos, your letters from different ambassadors to the U.S. government, and it goes back as far as Abraham Lincoln up through um, the early '90s, I believe, as far as what we have in print. And they also the, the newer stuff is put out through the State Department itself, and you can get that through their website. Okay. So then, when it becomes available, they must send you something. They they send you send you it, information online or through discs. I was just curious about ooh, that. Don't say. Uh, well, we, we <laughs> at, at one time uh, we used to, we used to receive um we still receive some print. And it comes in a box, and then we have to process it and, and make sure we get we get all the catalog records uploaded through Markive, which is the system we use. Um, so then we have to stamp them, and we stamp them Gov Docs, the date that we we receive them, and then make sure uh, we give it a SU doc. The SU doc number associates with that document, and then we put it on the shelf. For, and it's in our catalog. So someone who's doing a search and say the the Cuban Missile Crisis. Or they're looking for things from the Department of Education on the, the latest uh, stuff that's going on, say school shootings, and they want to see if there's anything been done through the, by the agency. Um, we have that. Again, we also have PEARLs, those electronic resources that, because uh, again, the majority of our stuff is coming electronically. Mm, okay. And and every monthly, they, they upload a batch of resources. Um, and that, like I said, we have maps that we steward. A large map collection, both uh, topographic maps that shows, you know, uh, terrain levels, to um, PREX type maps, which are your global uh, government maps, you know, of, of where countries are and their uh, with, and relevance to the world, um, and also Florida maps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when Bruce Barron was the government documents uh, librarian, he was talking about the map collection one time, and I told him that I had recently gone to California. We went hiking in a fairly isolated area, and no one's phone worked. But one of the people in our party was very experienced, had been there multiple times, and he had all the maps we needed. He, he knew exactly where we were going, but I was so glad that this person, you know, this ex very experienced hiker had all this on him. Otherwise, we would have been, you know, clueless. I mean, you would have had to have a super powerful, like a satellite phone, phone to have been yeah. able to get it. And, and who knows how good the reception was. But yes, print still has its place for sure. Oh, oh no, exactly. I, I mean, I guess we're the our blessings were born in both i'm born in the middle of both worlds mm -hmm. so I, I where i love holding a physical book and using it when i need to um but also have an access and searchability to um documents in this case that have been scanned and made available to digitally but yeah especially if you're on hiking in a, re a remote area <laughs> having a maps topographic maps can be very useful mm -hmm. um and that's the interesting thing you know people don't know when i do when i do a a, a road show and showed to government documents to young students you know they all think of the declaration of independence well, well i wish i had a copy of that the, you know, an original copy i don't but i say you know how many of you uh, people out there go to a national park and they raise their hands and i said well, how many of you've gotten a little map from a national park i said that's a government document mm -hmm. you know i say you know how many people have passports and some have passports I said, that's a government document so there's a lot of different areas and of types of documents that are made available for us to use both educationally and personally for our travels. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Larry, so, oh, go yes. ahead. I have a oh, question. Ahead, You'd mentioned something about a SUDOC. Is that like the numbering system for how government documents are filed? That's a good question. Yes. So while the, a traditional um, university catalog is through the Library of Congress and their numbering system, the government documents has a system all on their own, and it's one that can be very confusing to beginner researchers trying to navigate and where to find it. So one, that's why we isolate the print material to their own physical locations, so they're not mixed in and lost. Uh, but yeah, we have a SUDOC number system. The, the, so when you read the call number, similar to the Library of Congress where you have the call letter, that is based on the agency. So obviously um, NAS for NASA, um, D is for Defense Department, H is for Health, E is for Education. So the, each of the call letters represents the agency. If you ever come across a SUDOC that has uh, Y or X, those are congressional, uh, designated for congressional material. And then what happens is 
as it begins to break down, because ours, instead of just having a decimal, we have decimals, we have colons, we have slashes. That's how they break up the individual department within the agency and then unit within the department. So yes, the, uh, the SUDAC number, the SUDAC number system, the history behind that is pretty interesting. Um, if you have a moment, um, that goes back as far as 1891. Uh, at the time, a, a librarian was hired. Adeline Hasey, if I butcher your name, I hope her ancestors forgive me. Because um, there was no uh, depository library system. Things were kept. Uh, they were sent out to libraries, but they were, you know, willy nilly. Nothing was set in stone. And she was tasked in 1891 to create a numbering system. And a lot of the materials she started collecting were actually in um, offices at the different agencies where they were kept. So interior education. And she's the one who's credited with creating the actual SUDOC numbering system that we use today. So. Oh, and what does SUDOC stand for? Uh, uh, Superintendent of Document Classification. Yep. And that's what her title was back in 1891. Again, she was a librarian hired to do a job. And, uh, and basically, it was given to her, sadly enough, to uh, because they felt that only a woman would want to do that job. It was a job they felt beneath men at the time. But I would say thank God she did it because if not – all this information that the government creates, we it might be you know lost to us, uh, or have some other wonky uh, numbering system that isn't used today. So God bless her. And if, if students come and they can't navigate it and they, they're not sure where to look for it because they see slashes and dashes, I always say, come to a government documents <laughs> librarian. We'll find it for you. Uh, yes, and the fact that it's still being used well over 125, 30 years later, so it, it's still useful very much. Yep. Yeah. So, oh, and this is kind of, re this came from the talk that you and I had before we did the recording here, and you said something interesting about the Florida state government documents. Uh, you had mentioned, and I'm just taking a look at my notes, that they definitely have some different rules in federal level. But then you mentioned that there was no classification, and we have a little well, FAU has a little part in that that being rectified. Yes, in the beginning, when they when the the Florida State Library um, used to send out, and the things have much changed since then. When I when I worked in government documents initially, the first time when I was a staff member, um, they would we would get Florida documents from the Florida Library, and so, in some cases they didn't have call numbers, so. I, um, but I learned that Weena and and prior to Weena, who was a, a, a staff member at the time, and Don Smith, who was there, they started. They actually and the unit began to create uh, Florida numbers uh, for the for the document. So, and then as as they actually created a document number for that resource, it would go to other depository libraries holding Florida documents. Um, so yeah, we have a little bit of history in this on the Florida document uh, numbering system. Um, a lot has changed since then. Uh, the Florida Library no longer produces as much print material as they used to uh, due to their budget constraints and stuff. And a lot of things are just made available online. So we don't have to give call numbers out as often as we used to, which is good because I don't know how to do that. <laughs> it was it was between Don and Weena. <laughs> yeah, I would uh, whenever we got a new Florida document, I would let Weena handle that because she could look at it and come up with the numbering system really good. Um, and then you know, she never really taught me that because I was always handling the microfish. She was like, "You handle the microfish, <laughs> I'll handle this." I said, "Okay, teamwork." Yes. But yeah, we have a we have a little history there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was that was interesting when we were talking about. I go, oh, I bet everybody would be like to know about this. So, <laughs> so oh, and then something else that we had talked about too, and this is just quickly going back to the mm -hmm. federal level. Um, I had so you had told us that the Congress is, is the agency that governs the GPO. But I was curious about its connection with Library of Congress, if there is any. They have, there is, they don't have, I mean, uh, well, when connection in, G, mean GPO's connection? Oh, well, I mean, they're not under the same, well, I guess I should, I should say it differently. They're not under the same umbrella, are they? Not as far as governance, as far as, uh, like I said, GPO is the government publishing office. 
and they handle just government documents. They don't classify anything else but government documents. Um, so they don't deal with Library of Congress at all. Now, there's I'm sure there are items that have made its way into the Library of Congress mm -hmm. that have a crossover, you know, depending on how they were published. But for the most part, GPO is strictly government documents. Yeah, I know it's just sometimes for some people, if it's federal level, they might quickly assume, oh, it's all under one single agency, and this really isn't the case here. No, no. And, the, and the, actually, it wasn't until um, 1895 is when it fall, fell under, con under Congress's preview. Before that, it actually in 1812 is when it, it first started, and it fell under the, the Secretary of State's preview. Oh. And then between, and then and 1852 was under the Department of Interior. So it's like, okay, who wants to be in charge of docs? And then finally Congress said, okay, in 1895, we're gonna have GP, government printing office uh, handle, and it's all gonna be under Congress. And the government printing office uh, history is really interesting. They just had celebrated their 150th year in, in 2017, but they started, the, the actual law went into place uh, just after the Civil War started. So you can imagine that. Here, here, the union, wow. Abraham Lincoln and in, in, in the Union Army is trying to reconcile and bring the South back into alignment and into the states. And then they have a law where everything that is produced by the government is going to be maintained under one umbrella. It's amazing sometimes when you look at the history of things. Mm -hmm. So I guess things bounced around agencies just like they can now <laughs> in the presence. Yes. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you for that. So next, I wanted to ask about copyright. Um, let's see. It used to be said that all government documents are in the public domain, or a lot of people think they are. Uh, first, I think it's kind of a two-part question. The first part is, um, could you explain the idea behind that, the reason sure. why the government documents tend to be in the public domain? Sure. Well, I, for those who want to do some light reading in circular mm -hmm. 92 where the, all the copyright information comes from um, in section 105 it does state yes all government documents are in the public domain and it's done so because it one uh, the government works for us uh, and, it, uh, and it's mind, our, in the mindset and that everything that they produce we have access to so there's if there was copyright then they could very they could start to limit what we have access to right mm -hmm. so to to make sure we have access to the material it's, everything's kept in uh, as a uh, public domain now there are some documents um that fall under a special preview that does that may have or seek out copyright protection um and those are basically documents that are created at the learning facilities of the government your your annapolis your west points your marine corps university naval post grad schools and that's because you know a lot of that research while they may be using government resources to do the research, which are public domain, they are actually creating a new document, a new study um, that's being published. So they're allowed to have copy the, do the new document, not the original source material, but the new document that is created um, is allowed to be copyrighted and protected. Hmm. Okay. And then something else we also talked about too, was that um, contractors, because because it's not just the gov, you know, and federal or federal employees that create these documents, but a lot of times they have contractors and just private individuals. So what happens to work like tends to happen to that kind of work? That work also would fall under the, the protection of copyright because um, again, even though the material itself, the documents, the, the data that is public domain government material, once, whether uh, because they've contracted to work with a public, uh, private entity, you know, say like Boeing or uh, Ford or whatever they're working with, um, to work on a uh, a project, the material that comes that is born out of that project and made available can be protected. It's kind of like um, at a university right here at FAU, a faculty who um, produce something, even uh, using the resources and the material that the university provides, mm -hmm. it still falls under some of the you know jurisdiction of the university as far as who has rights and access to it. So again, it's uh, it becomes then it becomes copyrighted um, by the end of in this case the uh, private entity um, identity Boeing or whatever 
uh, through them, and you'd have to seek out permissions through the the actual agency, not agency, but the uh, private sector component that help produce or publish that material. Yeah, because I was when I was doing some research and background and getting some background information on government documents, I found a, um, a workbook. It's like a standards manual by the National Institute of Standards and Technology that's under the U.S. Department of Commerce. It's a really huge volume of just facts and figures, you know, and measurements and things like that. And it's it has multiple versions, and I can't give you the name of the document off the top of my head. I'd have to dig around, but it explicitly says that a lot of it is protected under copyright. So the more I talked to you about it, I understood, oh, yes, because they had a lot of uh, private citizens and scientists and people who contracted with them add information over the years. So it's a really weird document because some some entries in this handbook are public domain but then you see a lot are not and that if you if someone wanted to reuse them they would need to contact that particular author for the permission so i thought that was a little oh well this is an exception <laughs> okay right so i mean while the data that those private citizens who upload um authored and put into that material is public domain but it's just it's just the data itself. Once the data gets manipulated and 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 teased out per se, and the item is written and talked about, then it becomes you know it's allowed to become copyright because it's mm -hmm. it's creating something new. Mm -hmm. You know, whenever we do research, we're taking if especially when you use primary sources, you're using primary sources to create a secondary source. So the secondary source is what gets copyrighted, not the primary source. Ah, I see. Okay, but yeah, that was that was an. That was a weird one. <laughs> so I yeah, it, it's kind of, it's kind of hard for researchers because again, uh, they don't you know, like you said, they automatically assume that it be, oh, it's a government agency's name is attached to it. It's on the cover, NASA, Defense Department, whatever. That it must be, I must be okay to use it without any. Well, one, they should always play. Um, um, what's it called? Cite their work for you know, so they don't plagiarize. But if they're going into more detail or at using tables and or images from those uh, material. Definitely, if to, you know, in question, do some research and find out if it's been copyrighted because, again, that can get you in trouble. Yeah. Did you have any recommendations how somebody could find the copyright information in some of those documents? Um, well, and some most of the documents it should be pretty, you know, straightforward in the bibliographic uh, front uh, material. Um, it should say who owns rights to it. Um, and then if just contact um Oh, what's the unit that does copyright? Um, <laughs> Scholarly communications. Contact, well, yeah, <laughs> contact Christy. No, um, the one where like yes, interlibrary true. loan uses to get copyright permissions. Oh, um, cop, cop, copyright clearance, CCC. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that would be the place I would always tell someone to go to oh. to get, you know, definitely because if they should have a record of who has access, who has copyright on the the material, um. If they if it's not easily obtained through looking at the material itself. Okay. Good. Yeah, Good Larry, I found that that was true when I was looking at information about copyright and images. That if the uh, government had used an outside contractor for taking photographs or that type of thing, that um, you didn't automatically know if it was something that somebody individually owned that copyright to, or if they had given that cop their copyright over to the US government for that publication or just what? Yeah, it can be it can be a very slippery slope. Because uh, again, there is a lot of stuff, especially in the early days of, not, well, it's not really early days, but like the 50s and 60s and 70s, you know, where people were taking photographs, someone was hired to take photographs of a space launch for that moment. Get, turn the pictures over to NASA, who really has access to the pictures? And as the law changes and you learn, oh, it's the person who actually took the picture who has the copyright protection or can seek out copyright protection, not necessarily the person who has the holdings of the, the pictures. So it's definitely a slippery slope. So that almost brings up the possibility that you would have to find out what the copyright protections were for the year that that image was created then. So Mm -hmm. So it true. might because back in back in the past the copyright protections were much shorter, especially for certain types of formats. So mm -hmm. even if say I, I I don't know off the top of my head when cop how long images 
made in 1950 have copyright protection, but it may be possible that perhaps it had fallen out of protection. But we'd have to take a look at those uh, public domain charts or the hurdle table from Cornell University, perhaps, to determine that. Oh, definitely. And, then, and again, it just that it, it, that's where the researcher has to do their due diligence because mm -hmm. they're the one who is putting wanting to use the material um, in the, whatever document or creation that they're they're working on. Um, we can assist, we can help them and get them into the right direction. But we, like you said in the beginning of this presentation, we don't, we're not copyright lawyers. We don't give out hard, you know, our, our say is not the final say. Right. Yeah. That's what I always say. You know, we can give them information, but we're not lawyers, you know? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So the last question couple questions I have just have to do with how can we help you all? <laughs> uh, so the librarians and the library staff may receive occasional questions about items in government document. Can you provide us with some general tips or advice on how we could manage these questions? Well, um, if it's a document that we have in house, you know, they've searched a catalog, and they have a call a SU doc number and they so they can't find it and the, the librarian has attempted to help find it. You know, turn it over to myself, you know, kind of, you know say, if I'm out there, email me, say, hey, this patron's looking for this item, can you help them retrieve it? Or if uh, my staff member Daniel is in the office, he he can be he can help them search the stacks. Um Sometimes questions come out of the blue and they're more detailed type questions. I think we I mentioned this in our pre or previous discussion. Um, while we do have state uh, documents uh, and federal documents, we don't have local documents. And I had a, a patron who, through email, contacted me and was looking for a census. So automatically, I, you think federal. Well, we only do the census every 20 years. Mm -hmm. And they were actually looking at birth rates from Boca Raton um, for the off years, like 64, uh, 67, 73, very unique, specific years. One, we don't handle local material, um, again, because we feed in many, uh, local areas feed into the university. It's just, we won't have the space to maintain, to maintain it all. And so my, then, uh, my job was to reach out to the local, uh, in this case, Boca Raton government agency. One, find out if they kept such data records, um, which they did. Uh, but the, the, of course, they kept them in archives. You know, they, they, they just didn't have them laying around with immediate access. So I had to call our, their archive department and find out if they definitely had them before I turn. Because I want to make sure when I help a patron, I want to make sure I'm giving them the most final answer possible. If it's the final answer is, hey, we have it, I'll come in and get it. Or if it's, okay, this is who has it. Um, in this case, Boca Raton. Here's the archivist, the archivist who has access to it. Here's their contact information. You can, uh, they said contact them. They'll set up a time where you can meet with them and go down to their archives and look through that material. Um, and the, there's just some times where the material is just not available. Mm -hmm. They it just either because we don't have access to it or the age, the entity that had it no longer exists. Uh, and some things are behind paywalls, which we, you know, we can't, that's the sad thing with some government information. Once it gets, you know, purchased by private entities, um, you know, like take congressional record as an example, you know, while they're now backtrack, Congress is, and GPO has definitely done a good deal to go back to redigitize everything, but they don't go far as far back as say, as the congressional rec hearings of ProQuest. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you know, while if if, and if if a patron doesn't have access to the the private and the private resource of ProQuest, they won't be able to go far enough back. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just right. the nature of the other beast. But again, I always tell other staff or librarians just can't if they can't help them and they've tried. You know, I, one I thank them for trying. You know, I understand it's a very unique uh, system. Mm -hmm. uh, reach out to one of us in the government documents department, and we're always more glad to step in and assist. That's what we do. All right. What are some things you would like for us to remember about government documents? Hmm. Not to be, they're not scary. 
Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, they may have a, a, a numbering system that uh, seems uh, antiquated or barbaric or whatever. <laughs> it, it won't bite. Uh, the, um, doc, the documents there are primary, one of their primary sources, the majority of their primary sources, which is one great for research. Doesn't matter whether you're a, you're a historian or you're a scientist studying for the next, you know, space rocket design that needs to go to the moon. Um, there's a lot of good stuff there that can help you out. Um, one, um, it's the majority of it is going digital. So if you don't see it in print, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It just means you have to access it through electronic means. The good thing is there's no login required for government electronic resources. You just click on the pearl and there you go. And, um, just that the staff is here to help, uh, to help. And the citizens, students, faculty, anyone who comes into our doors to understand and find government resources. I think that's the one thing that that's actually where my um, MLS degree uh, focus was. You know, when I went to Maryland through online, yes. mm -hmm. it was uh, through e-government, mm -hmm. you know, and those of us who have all used the government resource, government website, you know, department agency website, we know they have uh, not the easiest ones to navigate. Uh, they have gotten better, mm -hmm. some of them, but they're very, you think as much as they want to be transparent, sometimes things aren't as easy to find and navigate on their website. So that and the it's the shock that how many people still don't have access to broadband in America. Oh, yeah, especially the rural areas. Areas mm -hmm. to access these things and or don't even have a computer. Mm -hmm. So that's why you're seeing you know, more and more go to the, I mean, because they're, uh, depository libraries aren't just in the university world. Mm -hmm. There are public libraries um, that are part of the system as well. And so if um, a, a person can't come in through our doors to access it, there's a good chance there's a local library close by in their area that may have government documents or at least access to those resources. Okay. And my final question, toughest question I think I could lob to you. So what do you think of the owls in the final four? Oh, they're going all the way. <laughs> I want to see I, if they're going to play Miami. Oh, that's that's going to be cool if they if they can if they do. Mm -hmm. I can see that's one. I, I would love to get some of those athletes in here. Like Golden, <laughs> he can get a picture of taking like, down a government document off the top shelf. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think I think they are. I think they can go all the way. I think um, Miami has a tougher row with Connecticut because mm -hmm. they, they've been winning by double digits, but I'm all <laughs> owls. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> all right. Well, did anyone have any final questions for Larry or comments? Okay, you're off, uh, Lori. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. I get myself confused between whether we are a depository or repository oh. library. As far as federal government goes, we are a depository. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because the doc, we're just the the um the material that we have in our doors, um is not mine. I'm just a steward of it. You know, one of many that come before me, Don Smith, my uh, pred uh, Bruce Barron, my predecessor, Don Smith before him, I think Peggy Walker before Don. Mm -hmm. You know, th their job was to be the stewards of the of the government documents, regardless of the format that they were in. Um, and that's it. I don't, you know, my job is to make sure they're available at all times when we're doors are open. All right. Well, thank you, Larry. You shared a lot of really good information about, about government documents. Uh, once we're done recording, I'll post this on the library's YouTube page, and then awesome. we can have it available for everyone to see. So I'd like to thank everyone for being here today, your questions, your interactions. Um, and thank you so much for making this what, what it became to the presenters, to the those who participated. Thank you so much. I'm still waiting for my coffee talk, coffee mug. I didn't get oh. one. Oh, darn. We, we, we ran out of money. Sorry. <laughs> no, thank you.